Hello and welcome. I'm Tracy Polowich, host of the Excellence Connection podcast, where we connect our listeners with subject matter experts, knowledge, and resources to help along the excellence journey and improve organizational performance. Today, I have Nancy Newmay with me, and Nancy works in culture transformation and leadership. And today, we're going to talk about planning for exceptional results. Welcome to the show, Nancy. Thank you very much, Tracy. And uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to address the audience of Excellence Connection podcast series. Um, thank you for having me. It's so nice to have you. Thank you for joining. Um, Nancy, can you give our listeners a brief introduction of yourself and some of your background? Absolutely. So um, just let me start with a few words about myself and what makes me who I am now. Uh, first, I'm a mom. I have two amazing young triathletes, Joe 16 and Taya 14, uh, from whom I learn more and more every day about commitment, perseverance, resilience, and purpose as they practice and succeed in this high endurance sports. And I usually start with my kids because as a mom, this is really what I'm, where I really, uh, my focus is in addition to my career. But on a professional aspect, uh, just I started my career in the micro microbiological research and quality in Belgium, uh, where I've studied and completed my two masters in total quality management and in uh, agronomic sciences and bioengineering. But only after my family and I moved to the United Arab Emirates, um, where I really started uh, my career in the corporate world with a short experience in a certification body. And then I spent 15 years in the food industry alongside the transformational experience, both in excellence and public service to different organizations. And this is what shaped my way forward and led me to establish my own company, Excelium, um, the first licensed affiliate of the Shingo Institute in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, my strengths mainly, Tracy, is around my expertise in system thinking, operations, quality, organizational design, development, uh, integrated management systems, and organizational excellence. Uh, holistic models such as the Organizational Excellence Framework, the Shingo model, and the EFQM model. Yes, and it's nice to have you as a um, fellow Organizational Excellence Specialist. And um, so let's get, let's get started. Uh, planning is a very important activity for organizations. And without good plans, um, organizations can find themselves in a very reactionary state, making it difficult for them to feel in control. So what are some of the key planning activities that organizations can engage in to achieve exceptional results? Uh, Tracy, I like your question, and I like the way you mentioned feel in control. Uh, organizations that like to feel in control, and everyone working for the organization and doing business or uh, having a particular interest in an organization usually needs to feel the same and have confidence in the organization ability to deliver its promise through its people. For me, it's about it's all about having an alignment between people, the goals and the objectives of the organization and the systems that the organization develop. So let me now answer your question for our audience. Uh, the plans that an organization needs to have as a minimum to achieve its goals and the good results start mainly with their strategic plan to identify what is the direction they need to take, what priorities to focus on and how to achieve them. And this should be in line with its uh, set vision and where it's intended to be in the long term. And the second plan, which I really recommend to have, is, and it's really, it's a must, the business plan that details the tactical activities and that aligns with the strategic plan and the direction the organization wants to achieve. The third plan that I think it's really very important is the one related to people, right? We need people to manage the, the strategic plan and to manage the business plan. We need to have organizational planning, a sound organizational planning that focuses around leadership development, succession planning, high performance identification, high performing, uh, whether teams or, or individuals, which relates to HR plans that the company needs to have in place. And definitely once you have your strategy in place and you have a good business plan and you have the right structure and the infrastructure you need to have also to, to manage these plans, you need to focus on your operations. You need to focus on your operational plan and have a sound plan to manage your resources, your products and services and how you design them and how you deliver 
uh, and you make sure that you meet your client's requirements. And within these plans, you should not forget uh, quality, safety, uh, environment, and everything that really uh, has an impact um, out of your activities. And definitely when you have all of these in place, one of the things that the pandemic had taught us is to have good contingency plans in place. You need to be able to uh, look at the unforeseen events. You need to look at, to be able to have your um, plans in place to make sure that your company has a good response to, to, to these unforeseen events and be able to have a certain good resilience to, be, to get out of these uh, circumstances and still meet its objectives. That really covers everything and sounds fairly comprehensive. Now, we often hear about organizations that engage in these planning exercises and, and develop their strategic plans and their business plans and safety plans and all of these documents, and then they end up just being put on a shelf and, and not necessarily put into use. Do you have any recommendations for how organizations can ensure that these carefully developed uh, planning documents are put to more practical use? Absolutely. I think what you said is absolutely right, that we see a lot of things that is being developed in organizations, but they're not really being executed. And execution, I think, is a key. And we say good planning is, have, is uh, the halfway to success, definitely. But we need to make sure that every plan we put in place takes us to where we want to go and it, it, uh, it achieves its uh, intended outcome and the best outcome that we, can get, uh, where we, can, we could get out of it. So for me, uh, for organizations to be able to um, execute these plans, first, I think it goes back to the design of the plan, to the, to the place where they really set that plan. They need to have really a buy-in of people in the plan. They need to involve people. They need to make sure that the plan that they put in place is really practical. And it's not something that people don't want to have or we're gonna be resistant to. And especially now these days, we look at transformation, we look at digitalization, and we see companies really changing things so quickly. So initially, before you put any plan in place, you need to make sure it's the right plan for you. And you need to make sure that your people are aligned with the plan um, you, you want them to execute. And next to this comes communication and an open dialogue about the challenges that people are facing. Plans are not perfect. Plans could have a lot of uh, loopholes. Plans could uh, not necessarily be the right ones sometimes for organizations. So you need the people to be able to tell you about it, be, be able to be open and share their concerns and challenges. And also from a uh, management side, you need to be able to communicate clearly about the plans. And I quote always Simon Sinek and the why. Whenever you put something out, you need to explain to people why, why you're doing what you're doing, why you have this plan and not another plan, why you have these objectives and other, or not other objectives. So you need to have that communication and open dialogue around your plans to get the buy-in of people and to make sure that they make sense to them. If a plan doesn't make sense to people, they're not going to follow, they're not going to execute. If a strategic objective, people cannot align to it and people cannot understand why their company is focusing on it, they're not going to relate to it. And finally, they're not going to get uh, of them the buy-in you, uh, you need of them. And I think also one of the good things for people to execute their plans is to consider a change management methodology or approach. Some plans are disruptive, some plans uh, require different, uh, different way of doing things. And then people need really to have these strategies in place to, to manage the change and make sure that they, they eliminate those uh, areas of concern to people and they manage to really get them on board. And there are other also uh, things to consider when we put a plan in place. We need to make sure that people have the resources to execute the plan. And a lot of, uh, I think, plans, when we look at the integration of management systems or even um, uh, any implementation of, of any uh, standard system, like uh, following ISO standards, if you don't give people the resources and you don't give them time and you don't allow them um, that uh, space within their, their work uh, schedule to do that and to have time to reflect on what they're doing and uh, to sort out the challenges, you, you can't really expect them to succeed. So that's something I think we really uh, forget. We do the plan, we don't really think about the execution and what it takes uh, for people to do that. And I think the last point to focus on when it comes to execution of plans is really having a continuous feedback and review uh, at all levels, sometimes we let people at low level do that uh, that review. We tell them you need to, that definitely you need to review what you're doing and make sure you're doing it right. But we don't take that feedback up. We don't go as management and review 
our plans and make sure that they are really still, I mean, they are suitable and they are something that uh, people want to continue working on. And once we have that feedback, I think it really helps to make sure that we do the right continuous uh, improvement and we do the right adjustment to our plans to make sure that they are executed in the right way. I do hope I've answered your questions, uh, Tracy. Yeah, what you're talking about just now is really what we um, talk about at Organizational Excellence Specialists and refer to as the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle. And so maybe just explain how that process works with the planning cycle and, and how you can achieve exceptional results that way. Absolutely. And I think all of us quality professionals and excellence professionals, we have the PDCA or the PDSA at the core of, of what we do. And, the, you know, the ISO standards now have that at the core of, uh, of the new standards, which they started using in 2015 onwards. Uh, the PDCA is very important or the PDC, PDSA. I'm more familiar with the PDCA, but I think both of them um, work well. So uh, for me, every organization needs to teach that uh, that simple, simple tool, simple methodology to its employees. Uh, I take always a simple example of any activity we do, uh, whether at home or professional um, setup is really, we need to start a good planning. And once we do the plan, we need to execute. And once we do, do execute, we need to check but uh, two things which are very important. And this goes back to my previous question, Tracy, and the answer I, I gave to your question is, uh, we need, when we have a plan, we need to make sure that the plan fits uh, what we wanted to, to achieve and it's the right plan for us. And we need also to check whether the plan, whether the execution of the plan has been as per the planning and the plan, the initial plan we put in place. So we check two things. We check the effectiveness of the plan and we check the effectiveness of the execution of the plan. And when it comes to, um, to organizations, uh, the having the cycle of PDCA is very important and we can teach it to everyone in the organization. It could be applied in everything we're doing in an organization. So once we do that check part, we need really to emphasize on the act and the, the adjustment part we need to do to make sure that um, uh, we go back to the plan and adjust the plan uh, if needed, based on the two things which I mentioned, the, the two checkpoints which I've mentioned. An organization, I think, if they want to really have sustainable continuous improvement project uh, process in place, they need to really teach their people the PDCA. If you don't teach people the PDCA, you don't expect everyone to get aligned and to get to, to become part of that continuous improvement journey. So going from high level systems and processes and the standards, which at their core, they have PDCA to the simple task that any that junior people are doing in the organization. If you teach PDCA and if you use it, you, you, are, then, you are sure then that everyone in the organization is gonna really put effort into that continuous improvement process. And they're gonna bring back a great value to the organization because everyone's gonna really at its own level try to uh, have that continuous improvement um, applied in what they're doing. And it goes back to the mindset. That's why I'm talking about teaching PDCA. You need to really have it as part of your day-to-day -day work. Once you teach it to everyone, once everyone has that mindset, uh, I think it really becomes part of the culture. And then it becomes something that everybody uh, is doing uh, because they get the habit into really following that methodology. And it's a simple methodology. It's, it's very complex sometimes at the heart of the ISO standard, but it's very simple. It's really a simple wheel, but really once you have that going on, you can start improving your standards and you keep that continuous improvement momentum going on till a place where you reach excellence. And I think this is the beauty of it. It's very simple, but it's so powerful that it really impacts organization as a whole, from the simple tools you use, from the practices of your people to the standards you have in place. It's really very, very powerful. And it's at the heart of the excellence models too. If we, if we look at the, um, uh, the, the organizational excellence framework and, and other excellence models, they really, um, they have at their core the continuous improvement thinking and methodology, and it's really about the PDCA. Thank you, yeah, that's great. And it's really like a, you know, these planning documents and the process is really like a roadmap and you identify your destination and then you plan your route and try to follow that. And you've got to check in at different points to make your, sure you're still on the same, you're still on the right track, right? And Absolutely. so I think that, um, 
that analogy helps people to understand what, what we're really using these um, plans for and how they can practically be put into use. So good. And um, you mentioned about how we're, you know, in changing times and things seem to be changing at an ever increasing rate. How do you respond to people who feel that planning is sort of a waste of time and that by the time they get their plans done, things have changed and then it's kind of useless what they've, what they've put effort into? My first reaction is that absolutely wrong. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I do understand um, sometimes that planning could be tedious. Sometimes people spend a lot of time planning, um, but the planning process itself uh, needs also to be efficient and effective. So that goes back also to the entire, I mean, every system we put in place, every process we put in place and every methodology we have needs to really give us good results um, in, the shortest, um, in the shortest period. And Tracy, this goes back to what you were talking about the roadmap. I think in quality we teach people, I need to go from A to B and I need to do it in the most efficient way to have a quality um, quality system in place, right? Now the continuous improvement cycle in all this is really about keep improving. And that improvement sometimes goes, doesn't take us from A to B straight, right? So we have those processes in, 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 in the middle, but still the continuous improvement helps us to go quickly, the quickest from A to B by having those uh, iterations and those improvements. But the planning process also, um, if I wanna go back to your question here, is really about uh, being, having flexible plans. And this is one of the things I think when we started the ISO implementation of ISO systems, companies took them in a very rigid way. The, the the, the standards themselves were very rigid, right? And we really had a lot of issues implementing those uh, systems. But when people understood that the, um, the standard gives you guidance, but you, you still have that flexibility around how you do things, what plans you need to have, how do you execute, and how do you define or design your, your quality products and services, this is up to you as an organization, right? You have that flexibility. You need to do what's fit for your organization. Same is for planning. When you put a plan in place, you need to keep in mind that that plan needs to be flexible but I think the, the most important in planning is to understand your plan in and out and how everything interconnects in the plan. When you know the plan, when you know what the resources you're putting in place, when you know what are the steps you need to follow, when you know what the outcome you want to have and what are the objectives you want to achieve, and you know how all of these interconnect in a way, it becomes easy for you to change your plan when it's needed. And you have to keep in mind that flexibility is needed, especially in these days. It doesn't mean planning is a waste of time. It means you need to have a good plan, but you need to understand how and when to change your plan when there's a need to. And I think this is something the pandemic taught us. And on a personal level also now we feel we can't do any long-term plans anymore, right? We don't know the world is changing. Everything is changing uh, so quickly that we can't really plan a plan ahead of time. Time. But we put something in front of our of our eyes. We put uh, we put the direction. We put a vision. We put a, you know something to achieve, and that determines uh, our plans finally. And we can keep changing our plans and adjusting them. But we need to keep in mind what are the interconnectivity of these plans and what are the resources we're putting we're putting in place, and how how to manage these plans. And, and this goes back to, to any system you have in place. The system is interconnected with other things. So once you understand the interconnectivity, changing it becomes, or adjusting it or tweaking it to the need of the moment uh, becomes more e uh, becomes easier. And I think that's flexibility we need in planning. It's not at all a waste of time, but it becomes a waste of time if we don't have um, good planning system that helps us understand the input, the output, and what we want to achieve. And I think uh, planning is the most important thing about planning is to be inclusive and uh, take into consideration everybody's inputs whenever it's needed to make sure that uh, we don't um, put things in place that are not really relevant um, and we don't understand the impact of these plans we put in place uh, on others in the organization. So. I think the, the interconnectivity of things is very, is very important to understand, uh, especially in planning and the resources and everything we, we put uh, in that plan and how it impacts other things in the organization. So what I'm really hearing you say is it's not a one-time 
one and done sort of activity. You need, it's a dynamic activity that you keep coming back to, refining, um, modifying to react and respond to what's happening in your envir environment. Absolutely. Tracy, I'm just going to take a simple example. When you go on vacation, right, you put a plan, but sometimes your plans changes when you are before you go or when you are on vacation or the weather changes or something else comes and you end up changing your plan. You end up tweaking your plan. And because you know what you want to do, what are your wants, what are your needs, you have a roadmap in front of you and then you change a little bit in, in, in that uh, in that plan you, you have put in place. So it's, uh, it's simple. Sometimes we tend to complicate things, I think, at organizational level. Uh, I think it goes down to the level of details you, you put in things, the level of understanding, the level of uh, alignment that helps make things flexible and helps us really have a good planning place. Um, you talked about communication quite a bit a, a few minutes ago and how important that is within the organization. And what about with external key stakeholders? Why is it important to perhaps share some of your planning with the external stakeholders? Uh, the same reasons why it's very important internally. Uh, it's really for alignment uh, to make sure that, especially if, if stakeholders are uh, have a big interest in your organization, you need to make sure that uh, your planning uh, also suits their, um, their requirements and meets their expectations. And communication is key. And when we do have plans, I think before even we finalize a plan, sometimes we need to take input of our stakeholders in our plan, isn't it? So if it's a board or if it's uh, our, our key suppliers, if we're developing, um, if our plan is related to new services or products, we need to take that input from them. So I think communication for me, uh, when it comes to, in, um, to kind of planning, is really about two ways communication with all stakeholders, internal, external. So you cannot really miss any of those uh, important communication channels. And uh, this initially at the design phase, initially at the planning phase, but also when your plan is, is, is ready, you need to communicate that also to, to your stakeholders to make sure that um, they contribute to its execution and they really help you achieve that plan. So it's really initial stage of planning. And then after the plan, plan is ready, you need to have that two ways communication. And communication is not just passing on information, right? You need to get feedback. You need to open the door for discussion if it's needed. Uh, and you need to really allow, uh, allow uh, that inclusive uh, dialogue with everyone to get input into, uh, into your plan, whether initially because you need to, to develop the plan or later on if you want to make sure that your plan is executed right. And this goes back to your question about execution and why sometimes we don't execute the plans is they remain just documents because we don't have that alignment that is really created through a dialogue sometimes and communication uh, with the concerned uh, stakeholders. Yeah, so I mean, if you can communicate with your stakeholders and have that open dialogue back and forth, perhaps they start pushing you to also be executing your plan or being a part of that. And that might help to keep that, um, that planning exercise more live, right? Absolutely. And this takes, I think what you mentioned here is very important, Tracy, because sometimes when you communicate things, this already have I, for me, it's half of the way, I mean, you're half through the execution, right? You put yourself in a place of accountability. You communicated something publicly, so you are now accountable to deliver. And that's, that's also important, I think, is to feel that heat of delivering uh, your promise, uh, what you put in a plan. So I think it's, it's very important, yes. Yes. Um, so in a recent article that you wrote for Insightism, you note that people first strategies are often lacking, starting from the initial planning phases of improvement initiatives. What are some of these people first strategies that you refer to and that organizations should employ in their planning phases? Yeah, I think this is a this is a very good question, Tracy, and it's very important. And we hear, we hear more and more talking about people first strategies. And I think the pandemic also taught us how it's important to focus on people. Um, we talked a lot about empathy, psychological safety um, during the pandemic because people felt that threat. Uh, but I think it it goes back to when we talk about this a lot in our, in in excellence models is. 
uh, the focus on people and putting the people at, at the heart of the organization. I mean, we say people our uh, we say people our um, are our uh, most important asset. I think they are the assets of the organization. Everything else. Uh, could be replaced, but talented people, uh, people who knows the organization, people who uh, really can can help the organization achieve its results because they are aligned with the organization and they have that commitment, uh, that uh, that engagement with what the organization wants to do is very important. In my article, I spoke about, I speak usually about um, three things which I think very important, three E is they engage, they empower, and they excel. And in all of this, it's really, uh, it's really about the people, about um, making sure that we have an inclusive culture. And a lot of times we, we think we have a good culture because we, we, we focus on people. It doesn't mean we really are putting people first. Uh, we have to make sure that we have that inclusion of people. And I spoke about it at the planning phase, at the initial, design, this, uh, initial step of putting a plan in place. Uh, it's important to hear people, to listen to them, and to have their voice heard in what we're, we're doing and have input from the people in what we're doing. Uh, at all levels, sometimes we feel that decisions are taken at a high level in the organization and we forget that people are the, the one who are doing the work. They have they know what's going on. They, they know sometimes more than what the management knows about the challenges of the organization. And the place um, with the people, you have the problems, you have the solutions to sometimes, and we need to trust them. And that um, engagement has to happen uh, and it has to be driven by the um, from top down. We can't just count on them, the management to do it. So the, the, the talk about engagement, the message from the management and having systems to engage people is really very important. And this is how we show that we're putting uh, emphasis on, on people in the organization. It's not just about uh, the, the, the empathy feeling. It's not about supporting them or, or meet our uh, focusing on their needs and, and how to, um, or just recognition. It's, it's really about having a culture where everyone in the organization is really um, feels that he's important and he's contributing to the organization and we need to put all of these things in place to get their voice and to, to make sure that we listen uh, to them as, as managers. And the other point which I really focus on is empowering people. And uh, sometimes we we, we tell people that they have the freedom, they can do things, uh, we, we uh, open doors for them to, to try things, but we don't really uh, have systems to support that. Uh, or when they fail, we have that sometimes blame culture, or we, we are not open to even sometimes to let them try an experiment. And this goes back to creating a learning organization. People need to be empowered. They need to be really having the bandwidth to try new things. Uh, I believe, uh, same as flexible plans, I believe that we need to have uh, that flexible environment. But also I believe as a quality professional that we need to have certain boundaries. So you need to design these systems where you allow people to try and to experiment. Of course, you need to be able to protect your organization in a way. So you need to create that balance and that equilibrium within your organization to have and have systems that allow people to try new things and contribute ideas, thoughts, uh, to, to the organization and in addition to sorting out problems and we as quality professionals and we focus on, uh, on problem solving most of the time. But we saw uh, also lately that uh, we've, a lot of organizations are using design thinking uh, to, to involve their employees and, uh, and have uh, that contribution. Uh, from their, from them uh, into what they are uh, designing and what they are, the new products and services they're designing for their clients. So this is the empower. We need to open the door for people to learn uh, new things. Uh, we need to allow them to experiment, fail, and still uh, contribute positively to the organization. And I think the last thing is really about um, excellence and about uh, how to bring people to fulfill their potential and become excellent. And once your people are really having uh, that uh, performance, high performance, they're gonna definitely drive high performance in the organization. So you need to engage them, you need to empower them, and also you need to bring them to a state where they are really uh, delivering to the best of their abilities. And this comes from also telling them what you expect from them, telling them what results you want from them, but telling them also what behavior uh, you expect from them. And uh, we know now that the culture is really taking a great um, 
uh, place, I think, in, in everything we do. We talk about cultures all the time. And definitely the most successful organization in transforming are the ones who had a positive culture and who managed really to have a culture where people uh, felt uh, safe, where people felt empowered and people were engaged in what the organization is doing. And this all comes also from making clear to people what are the expectations from them in terms of behavior, in terms of uh, results also. And I think this is one of the key things is really making, putting people at the center of everything. And this is really what it's a people uh, first strategy is really focusing on people uh, and putting them at the center of what you're doing. Yeah, so there's, we know of a lot of the formal systems, I guess, like having brainstorming sessions and um, putting into performance, um, like performance measures or performance expectations into employment contracts. And, and those are maybe more formal ways of doing what you're saying, but even I think the most successful um, methodologies are a little bit less formal and kind of built into the day-to-day. -day. Is there anything that you can recommend to help an organization that maybe hasn't had that type of a culture and what they can do to start having or building that culture? Absolutely. And I also want to comment at, um, on what you said, Tracy. A lot of companies move from the appraisal system the way they became uh, very utilized lately is they moved from that uh, performance measurement and the way that I think became very common um, in different organizations because they wanted really to have that constant evaluation of people. You cannot wait at the end of the year just to come and tell someone if he had done right or wrong, if he performed or not, and tell him uh, what you expect from him. So it has to be an ongoing process. And it's like you said, it's day to day activities that we need to put in place. Uh, what I was trying to talk about uh, when it comes uh, about the culture is really about defining what the behavior of people should be. And this is we, uh, I don't know, people in health and safety would understand behavioral based safety. We talk about changing behaviors. And uh, if you wanna really uh, have an inclusive um, uh, culture, it's really changing the behaviors of managers, changing the behavior of everyone in the organization to have that inclusiveness. Uh, and it's really about the actions they have and the action they take. Um, the, the models of cultural transformation talks really about uh, defining the behavior you wanna see in your organization and then teaching people that behavior and telling them. And this goes back to, to, to the why of Simon Sinek. And you need to tell people why, why they need to do something and how to do it. So we focus a lot sometimes on the how, we forget about the why and people don't connect easily with that. So when it comes to people is really about behavior, it's about actions uh, and it's about uh, what we see from them on day-to-day -day basis. So if I'm a manager of an organization and I want really to have that uh, people first strategy in place. Uh, I will not wait just for meetings. I will not wait for a uh, one year appra uh, uh, yearly appraisal uh, to, to have that. I will have coaching sessions. I'll be present with my people more. Uh, I will visit them maybe on like once a week or twice a week or three times a week, talk to them in their, in, in, in their, in the, in their workplace, try to understand the challenges that they're, they're having. And in quality, we talk about the Gamba. It's very important to be present and to, be, to, to go to the Gamba and see what's going on. And as a, as a leader, we need to be present. I think this is really, uh, by present, it's really about uh, giving time uh, to, to talk to people, to understand uh, the challenges they're having and to understand also their aspirations and the, what they want to complete and achieve and help them fulfill that potential. So there's a lot of things on day-to-day -day basis we can do. Um, and we can use systems like the suggestion schemes we have. I spoke about design thinking in, in a way that we can design even include people in designing services, not necessarily just products. So uh, we can have that methodology put in place. There's a lot of tools. If you look at design thinking, um, the methodology itself is, it talks about products, but there are a, um, a lot of tools that has been developed to make sure that we can get people involved uh, in these activities. And uh, it's really about systems we put in place, about, uh, goes back to meetings, of course, but it's also about the coaching, is about uh, the time we spend 
uh, understanding how to improve things for people in the organization. And again, I'm gonna reflect on the PDCA, right? We need to use the PDCA and look at with the results we're achieving, achieving with our people, not their results, the results of how we are dealing with them. Is this going in a good direction? Uh, do we see people more involved? Do we see people uh, more engaged? Do we see them happy? Uh, are they able to share uh, to share things of their daily life in the organization, or is it really a place where it's meant only to be for work? Uh, so relations have changed uh, across the years in the organization. And as a mom of two, uh, two adolescents who are Gen Z and they're going to be um, part of that workforce uh, in the future, uh, I know that the Gen Z have different aspirations in the community and the organizations, and they want that relation. To be to be based on um, on different elements than when we we ourselves grew up, we were focused on performance. We were focused on uh, achievements. Uh, they want meaningful relationships. They want meaningful jobs. And uh, I think it's really important to, to start having that balance and changing the workplace into something where everyone aspires to be part of and everyone looks forward to be, to be working in. Yeah, I, I really like um, what you're talking about in engaging the employees and really trying to understand what they want as well. And I think that's very meaningful for getting them further engaged is if you are demonstrating your willingness to invest in, in what they is important to them as well, that um, you know just means that much more to them to do well for your organization. And um, the other point that I heard from you is just about um, um, the matter that us as leaders, managers, supervisors, we almost need to build into our daily work a, sec a, a time and the capability of being able to spend time on, on these activities. We are so focused, I think, on doing our jobs as leaders and managers and, you know, the, the tactical work, but we forget that we actually need to work into our schedules the time to spend with our people and building that culture. And, and it should be planned just like any other activity, like um, if you have an annual or monthly or weekly activity that you engage in in your normal job, you just need to add this to that as well, so that you have that time and capacity to be able to do a good job of it. I can't, I mean, it's, um, Tracy, what you're saying is, is very important, and, and it really, it's, uh, it, there's one article that I read lately is about, uh, I think, we focus so much on performance that we created cultures which are performance obsessed cultures. Um, I think the shift now is towards a growth uh, culture and growth mindset and make sure that people um, not just work all day, that they see that, that they connect on a different level and try to fulfill their potential and try to do some things differently and uh, enjoy what they're doing, which is very important. And I think leaders have to give the time to be part of that um, that uh, space of the employees and make sure that they really uh, support them and to get, a, uh, get that happiness uh, in the workplace. And with the pandemic, I think we all of us felt how important it is to the small things, right, in our daily life and, and having that small connection between the manager and the time to give to back to the employees is very important. Yes, and the work you do puts a strong emphasis on that corporate social responsibility. So how can organizations create strategic and business plans that are aligned with CSR? Uh, I, I think CSR is by itself, it's, it's, a, it's something that organization is really um, uh, putting a lot of importance on these days and we're moving even to, to ESG. Um, the CSR part of the the organization and it's um, it's really finding things that are uh, aligned with your purpose, aligned with uh, what you do and relevant to your organization first. So you need to put CSR plans which are relevant to your organization and which your people connect to also. 
sometimes organizations do uh, CSR activities or programs or things which are not really um, suitable for the kind of things they uh, they focus on. And sometimes the people can't really uh, relate to them or, or feel engaged with. Um, I had a lot of work here. I mean, I've been working a lot here with different organizations, different groups. And uh, in the organization I worked, uh, in earlier, uh, when we started taking the opinion of employees about what they like, and when we started evaluating even the programs we put in place and see where people are contributing or not contributing, where people feel happy or, or not engaged, we started looking at narrowing down those activities and those programs to things which are more meaningful to us and relevant to us as an organization. So when we talk about strategy and business plan and CSR plans, they go hand by hand. First, because they are about your people, they're about the community you live in and you were, I mean, and which is surrounding you. And it goes back also to the stakeholders you interact with. So it's about your clients, your vendors, uh, because some CSR activities are done uh, in relation to, uh, or uh, in conjunction or in collaboration with, with clients and vendors of organization. So you need to make sure that you have the input of everyone also, and make sure that your plans suits everybody. So once you look at it from this perspective, CSR plans that definitely has to be aligned with the strategy and the business plan of the organization. So you need to set your CSR plans and you need to then go back and look at your strategy and business plan and see whether they meet the objectives of the organization. So also strong alignment is important in, uh, in this perspective. So um, because it talks about your stakeholders, because it talks about the image of the company, the reputation and the uh, the way you want people to see you as an organization. And in EFKM model, we have that part of societal uh, measurement and, uh, and, and we have, we, we ask organizations to do so, you know, public um, perception of, of the organization. So if some, if these, there's no alignment between the strategy and the CSR plans, you won't be able to achieve both of them in a good way. So definitely, I think both of them, they help each other um, and they take the organization to a different level. Uh, by focusing on the community around and the giving back to that community and uh, having those meaningful relations. And it all, uh, CSR is also about partnerships and organizations can succeed only with the partnerships they put in place. So it really fits in. Oh, Nancy, this has been great. I think you've um, provided a lot of great information that I think will be valuable to our listeners and practical ways of putting in place and planning systems and, and tools that will help them to keep those plans um, very active and practical for their organizations. Uh, my last question is, and we touched on this just briefly earlier, about the growth mindset. How do you remain in a growth uh, zone, in, the, in a growth mindset zone? Oh, it takes a lot of effort <laughs> to remain in the growth mind or to be in, in a growth uh, mindset zone. Um, I've read the book of Carol Dweck, which talks about the mindset, the new psychology of success. Um, and uh, I, I think it's really about creating or, or living in a space where you can allow yourself also to, to learn new things. Uh, to network, to experiment, uh, to um, and and don't be afraid of trying always new 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 things and uh, at least admit to yourself that there's a lot of things in the world that you still need to learn and have that humbleness to to learn uh, from others and I think uh, putting yourself in a place where you're connected with people we, we use the word like-minded people. Um, I think it's important, but I think it's also important to, to be with people who have different, um, different knowledge, different expertise, and learn from that. Uh, it opens uh, opportunities uh, to learn new things and to do new things, and I think this is very important. Uh, other element is also really to um, take on challenges. Uh, I think this is where we really learn how our potential and understand uh, what we can do and what we cannot do. And we definitely need to work on the things or improve the things which we feel we have a certain weakness in uh, and uh, keep making effort um, to, to develop ourselves. Uh, it takes really effort, it takes time. Um, and that's where we say sometimes some people are in their comfort zone. Growth mindset is really the, the opposite. Uh, if you let yourself be in this um, comfort zone, then you're not allowing yourself to keep growing.
and you need to know, know uh, new things and learn new things to grow. And uh, I think one of the things which were hard a little bit for me to, to do is to accept criticism initially, constructive criticism. Uh, I think this is one of the things that help us really um, push ourselves a little bit uh, forward every time. And I believe in the power of habits. And uh, this, there is this rule of 21 days uh, to get a new habit. And whenever you want to change something, you need to focus on it 25 days to, to get the habit, the new habit, and then becomes part of you. And this is how you get the PDCA into what you do on a daily basis and improve uh, your, your practices and, and, and change and, and keep improving. And um, I think uh, one of the things which I need to learn more, I think, which is very healthy for, for to be in that growth mindset is work-life balance. Uh, which I think I have to give myself the advice of uh, pursuing that a little bit more. And I think I uh, would like to maybe, Tracy, uh, close with this saying, which is very close to my heart. Um, it's about your attitude determines your altitude. And because it's remind me of um, an athlete champion um, who really kept this as his motto and uh, he won his first championship at the, at the age of 50. So uh, major championship. So it's really about uh, keep pushing us forward, ourselves forward and believe in ourselves and have the confidence that we can keep improving. That's a really great motto. And I think something that we could all do a little more with, uh, um, with respect to what you're saying is finding more work-life balance. And we um, get so tied up with what we think our responsibilities are and and become too possessed with that I think sometimes <laughs> so well thank you so much Nancy it's been great talking with you today and I really appreciate you sharing your expertise with our listeners Tracy thank you very much for this opportunity I really enjoyed talking to you and um, thank you very much again all right bye-bye